You take your Bibles, if you would, turn them to Luke chapter 18. We're in Stewardship Month. And today we're going to talk about doing the why, not the what. Now, I will tell you, we got the best church in the entire world. Y'all are awesome. We got a good crowd here. We have bad weather. Uh, Pastor Howell is not here. And you're still here. And I was looking up this morning at um, excuses and reasons people don't come to church. Uh, what, what are their excuses to go ahead and not come and not be a part? And so there's some pretty good ones here. Number one was, God told me I needed to stay home this Sunday for some reason. And uh, uh, I didn't want to argue with God. All right, what a great excuse. I'm sure God told a lot of people you shouldn't go to church this morning, but a lot of people use that. Another one is, I, I worked too many hours this week. Another one is, is the music's too loud. Another one is, the music's too slow. Another one is, it's too old. Another one is, it's too new. It's too contemporary. Well, the fact is, all of us choose and pick out different reasons. Um, I didn't come today because there's too many people. They're having a big day trying to get everybody to get there. I think that's the point, isn't it? They're having a different speaker today uh, is one of the big excuses people say. Some people say the pews are too hard. Some people say the pews are uh, too soft. This is a great one. I just don't feel like I'm getting fed. All right. Well, maybe it's because you're not eating. All right. It's like going to a buffet and saying, I couldn't find anything I liked. All right. Um, another one is, I don't know anyone there. Well, maybe if you went to church, you would know them. I can't go there because there's too many hypocrites. Anybody been to Walmart lately? Okay. Um, I just don't have anything to wear. All right. That's a great one. Um, Let's see here. That church just wants my money. That's why we don't come to First Baptist in January. Amen? It's stewardship month. Uh, I can't come alone. All my family has to come or I'm not going to come. Uh, let's see. they got a lot of excuses here. Um, no one checked on me after I missed one week, so I don't come anymore. That's a good excuse. Um, Nobody shook my hand. Nobody cares about me. Uh, someone told my child to be quiet. Uh, the parking lot's too full. Um, nobody goes to that church, so I shouldn't go. Wow, lots of excuses. Okay, This was my favorite, though. I will go to church when things get right between me and God. Well, where's the best place to do that at? Amen. All right. So it's interesting. You can find everything on the internet, can't you? Well, today we're going to talk about a little along that lines of why we do what we do. And I'm going to talk to you about doing the why, not just the what. Doing the why, not just the what. If you take your Bibles, Luke chapter 18, and let's start in verse 18. The Bible says, And a certain ruler asked him, saying, Good master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said unto him, Why callest thou me good? None is good, save one that is God. Thou knowest the commandments, do not commit adultery, do not kill, do not steal, do not bear false witness. Honor thy father and thy mother. And he said, all these have I kept from my youth up. Now when Jesus heard these things, he said unto him, yet lackest thou one thing, sell all that thou hast and distribute unto the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come, follow me. And when he heard this, he was very sorrowful, for he was very rich. And when Jesus saw that he was very sorrowful, he said, How hardly shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of God? For it is easier for a camel to go through a needle's eye than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. Let's go ahead and pray. Lord, thank you for loving us. Lord, I pray that you would help us as we seek you. Lord, I pray that we would focus on the heart of the matter rather than sometimes just on the what of the matter. 
and recognize that as we are stewards, that we give of our time, our talent, and our treasure. In Jesus' name, amen. As we see here in this passage and we, we look, we first are going to look at the why of the why. Why did this man have such a struggle coming and doing what Christ laid out for him? We see in this thing, sometimes people say, well, is he saying that you have to do works in order for someone to get to heaven? No, he was trying to help this man understand that he was a sinner and that he was in need of Christ. Yet this man said, I keep every commandment. All right. Uh, that would be like people might ask me, how is your marriage? I would say my marriage is good. But if they say, so are you a perfect husband? No, I'm a smart mouth, all right? I like to be sarcastic. And, uh, you know, there. So I do have faults in my marriage, all right? I do have things that I could do better. But this man, when Christ asked him, are you a sinner? He said, no way, I do everything perfect. Who here is perfect? All right, uh, none of us are. Bible says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Yet this man had confused himself because he had taken the Ten Commandments and convinced himself that he was perfect. He also had the wrong picture of who God was. Because if you look, when he came to Christ, he called him good master or teacher. And he said, hey, you're a good master, you're a good teacher, but he did not call him God, and Christ called him on it because he said, there is none good but God. He said, so if you're going to call me good, you're calling me God, which I am. But this man didn't get it. This man was successful in what he did. He was a rich young ruler. He had these riches, yet he was trying to enter things in the wrong way. First off, we see that the ruler was trying to reach heaven by his what's. So many times we try to attain both salvation and sanctification. God's, we try to gain God's acceptance by what we do. I know some people who think that because I do this or I do that, I will gain eternal life. I will gain God's acceptance. I will gain what God wants me to have. But guess what? The what's don't get us acceptance. The Bible says there is none righteous, no, not one. And there is nothing that we can do to get ourselves to heaven. And honestly, because we're sinners, there is nothing you can do to gain God's acceptance except be his child. You see, the truth is, if you're saved, God accepts you today. You're his child, and he does not see your sin. He accepts you, but this man was trying to do his own works for acceptance. It is so funny because... Uh, oh, we get a lot of phone calls here at First Baptist Church asking for things. Uh, we get phone calls asking to pay rent and pay somebody's power bill and pay this and that. And I get to handle a lot of those phone calls. They, they come in and try to tell. But my favorites are always the person who calls up and says, uh, I just want you to know that I am a faithful member of First Baptist Church. I pay my tithes, and um, uh, now it's time for you to pay me back. I need to pay my consumer's bill today. Now, uh, you know, the fact is, is uh, I always take, and I, I, they'll say their name, and I've been here now, I'm on my 25th year, and I tend to about know just about everybody and know everybody who's been coming. And they'll give me their name and I'll be like, you know, I don't know you. I am so sorry. Well, hey, you must have not been there very long because I have been coming. And uh, I'll, I'll say, well, I'm Pastor Cowling. Uh, uh, have, have I met you before? Oh, no, that's because you're the new guy. Okay. <laughs> You know, they're, they're trying to use a what? I, well, I pay my tithes, you owe me. 
Uh, I'll always go and I'll, I'll talk to Donna. We'll pull up our databases and we'll find out that they attended once. Well, sometimes I'll even go a little bit further and pull the giving records and find out that they put $5 in once into the offering back in 1972. But, you know, people think that I did a good thing because I gave here. If you look at this world, everybody is trying to prove that they're a good person. The verse I used a minute ago, there is none righteous, no, not one. We have to recognize that if we're going to come to the throne of God, we have to humble ourselves and realize that we're not good. That there, As he said here, there is none good but God, but we have to humble ourselves before him. But the ruler was trying to do good things to attain heaven. You will not attain heaven, nor will you attain anything else from God by your good works. Second thing is, the, his view was blurred by his focus on his own agenda. You know, our view of our stewardship is often we set the table on what we think is a good Christian. We set the table on what we think is a good steward for God. First, we see that he set the table with, um, I am good because I keep the Ten Commandments. Now, should we keep the Ten Commandments? Yes. We should keep the Ten Commandments. We should try to do right. We should try to do what God wants us to do. But the fact is, is we cannot stand on the fact that these are my rules. Because what we do is we look at everybody else and say, man, I wish everybody kept the rules I keep. But here's the problem is, is we, we got both sets of camps sitting on the same row, even though they're not related today, all right? And both brother camps back there, I guarantee they both have different rules they live by. Different rules that they live their family by. And I bet you the one brother camp back there could take and tell you these, this is what my family does. And they were much stronger than the other brother camp. And the other brother camp could say the same thing. I have these rules that are strong. But they both have other rules that are weaker. Did you know that the what's don't make you spiritual? And that is the point here. He was trying to tell this rich young ruler that what you do, although those things are important, that you do what God leads you to do and all that, that's not what it's about. And in your stewardship, how much you give is not important. Uh, the what there, it's the why. It's what God is leading you to do. It is that you do what he is leading you to do and understanding the concept. See, there some of you in the here have the ability to give a large amount of money, yet it isn't near as much as the person who obeys completely. We see this in scripture. We see the lady who took and she gave of her two mites, and we see of the other person who gave a large amount in front of everybody and Christ said that this woman who gave the two mites was so much more spiritual. He was focused on his own agenda. He was focused on keeping his set of commandments. Number two, he, he was focused on making money. It was important to him. We see that his riches were important. It ultimately uh, stopped him from surrendering to the pattern of what Christ wanted. Does your financial view of what you have to have stand in the way of what God wants you to give? And does your view of your time and your talent, does God sometimes say, I want you to give of your time and talent over here? I want you to serve over here? You know, I want you to come to uh, soul winning, uh, all church soul winning at four o'clock on Wednesdays. Well, I'm just getting out of work and it's so much. And then we got church Wednesday night or I want you to come on Saturday morning and I want you to come to prayer meeting at 930 and I want you to go out soul winning at 10. And you say, well, you know, I got a lot to do and I already go to church more than everybody I know. You know, you're stuck on the what's rather than understanding the why of what God wants you know, we look at the why and we see George Mueller said when a man asked George Mueller uh, the secret of his service, 
Mueller responded, there was a day when I died, utterly died, died to George Mueller, Mueller, died to his opinions, his preferences, his taste and will, died to the world, its approval or censure, died to approval or, or blame of even of my brethren and friends. Since then, I have studied to show myself only approved unto God. You know, the fact is, is we have to recognize that what's important is that what we do has to be led by the Holy Spirit. What we do in our service has to be guided by Him and understanding the heart of the ministry. James Calvert went out as a ministry or as a missionary to the cannibals. And he went to the Fiji Islands. At that time, they were uh, cannibals and uh, a lot of people were fearful for him. The ship captain tried to tell him, uh, we need to turn back and you can't go to that island. I know that island, it's dangerous. He told him, you will lose your life and the lives of those who are with you if you go amongst those savages. James Calvert turned and replied to him, we already died before we came here. What God wants from you today is your heart surrendered to him. What God wanted from the rich young ruler here was not for him to do more works, was not for him to take and uh, uh, do more things. What he wanted was his heart and said, just give me everything that you have. But this rich young ruler had one more problem, and that was he lied to himself in order to accomplish his own agenda. See, we often fake ourselves out and we think that we're all good. We think that because I do this and I do this, that is enough. This rich young ruler was having an argument with Jesus Christ, trying to prove that he was a good enough person to get to heaven. And had himself convinced of that until Christ found the one thing he wasn't willing to release of himself and give to Christ. And that was his riches. That was his control. And he was lying to himself that I am good because he said it multiple times to Christ until he couldn't say it and he had to walk away very sad. Have you faced yourself and say, God, have I given everything to you? Or are you still lying to yourself and trying to convince yourself that you're okay? I find many different reasons that we do this. One of the biggest ones is self-preservation. On January 13th, 2012, the massive Costa Concordia cruise ship with more than 4,200 passengers on board was sailing off the coast of Italy on a tour to the Mediterranean Sea. The captain deviated from the plan course and the ship struck a reef and got stuck on that reef near the shore. After taking on water for a while, the ship began to sink. Abandoning his duty to the passengers and crew, Captain Francesco Chettino left the ship. Instead of remaining on board, he took his private boat and left the ship. The Coast Guard uh, worked with him uh, and kept telling him, get back on the ship, work with your crew, try to save everyone. And they kept asking him, are there women and children who need your help? But he would not reply. The captain only responded with, you realize it's dark and we can't see anything. We really don't know what's going on. The Coast Guard kept saying, you keep telling us this, get back on board. But unfortunately, 30 people lost their life because the captain did not take care of what he was supposed to on that ship. You know, many of us, that captain's thinking, I'm saving my life, I have my boat, and I have to take care of myself first. And because of that, uh, many people lost their life. I found this story intriguing because we hear stories like that from the like early ship stories from the 1900s, early 1900s. But this happened in 2012. You know, in today's world, we often 
allow the ships to sink because we're more concerned with ourselves rather than the agenda that God has for our lives. Our why is stuck on self-preservation. Our why is maybe, um, well, I'm going to be a good moral person. Our why may be, well, I've got to help here, and then when I have left over, I will give to God. Rather than saying, okay, God, I give myself to you. So then we switch to the way of the why. What, what is the way that I'm supposed to go? What am I supposed to do? The why of Jesus' answer was to humble and submit ourselves to faith in Jesus Christ. He, he needed to take and say, okay, Lord, whatever you want, I'll sell in everything I have. I, I will give of myself. I'll quit trying to achieve heaven on my own. I'll quit trying to treat, achieve your acceptance on my own. And I realize that all you want is for me to humble myself. The Apostle Paul said, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. During this stewardship month, there isn't a set amount that we're seeking from you because that's not what stewardship is about. We don't have stewardship to bless First Baptist Church and the Lord has blessed us in a great way. We have stewardship because we want you to be good stewards of what God's given you and present yourself to God a living sacrifice. That's what he wanted from this rich young ruler. God, whatever you want. God, however you want me to give, I'll give. Recently, I was faced with this. I, my wife and I were in Aldi. I, I like to go to Aldi and uh, get, I, I'll go get all my canned goods that I get at Aldi because they're really cheap. And so I'll get lots of things there. And they also have gluten-free food. And I have to be gluten-free. So I, I'm loading up my car, get my gluten-free stuff and all that. And I walk in and the, there was a lady in there. She was a former RU student and hadn't been in a while. And I will tell you, it was a student that I sometimes had had some issues with. I didn't really like their attitude. I didn't like their demeanor of how they handled things. And um, I hate to say this, but when they stopped coming back, I, I, I didn't throw a party, but I didn't cry either. Yeah, you know, is, is that bad? I'm sorry. I, I, I was doing the what's rather than the wise with her. I, I hadn't been praying for her. I hadn't there. And as soon as I saw her, she's coming down the aisle one way and I'm headed the other towards the back of the store. And the Holy Spirit says, you need to be a blessing to her. You ought to pay for her groceries. Now, I didn't hear her voice, but I knew that's what God wanted me to do in, in my stewardship. And immediately I thought, thought, you know what, you're just thinking that because she hasn't been to RU and you can't bribe her to come back to RU. That's just you, it's not God. So I made myself feel better and I kept going down the aisle, get my gluten-free stuff, my canned goods, and I turn around and come the next aisle and you know what, she was coming down that aisle. I got irritated and I was like, Lord, you know, and he's like, are you going to pay for her groceries? And I, in my mind, convinced myself that I did not need to do it. And I went down that aisle, and it was all good. You now, there's four aisles there. So guess what happened when I went down aisle number three? She was there. And I said no to God again. I was stuck on the what? So I, I do good. I took good care of her, and I had every excuse in my mind why I shouldn't take care of her. I went down the fourth aisle, and yes, she was there. I said no to God again, and then I, I kind of negotiated. Do you ever negotiate with God? I said to God, I said, God, if you, if she is in the aisle, uh, if she's up at the cash register when I'm there, then maybe you want me to pay. I got up to the cash register and she wasn't there. I was like, yes! I paid. And as I started to walk out, she came up to the register. I was out of the store and I will tell you, now God doesn't do this, but in my mind, it, Holy Spirit was like, son, I am going to take and I'm going to strike you with lightning. I'm going to wreck your car. I'm going to throw you off a cliff. 
if you don't obey what I want you to do. And my wife will tell you, I turned around, took my wallet, tossed my wallet to my wife and said, God told me to go pay for that lady's food. And my wife went in and paid for it, came back out. Now, you know what? I have not seen that lady since. That's not why God told me to do it. But we often, are we intuitive and are we humbling ourselves before God and doing what he wants us to do? See, that whole issue I don't think had anything to do with that lady. God wanted me to humble myself before him. And a lot of our obedience, did you know God can do his job without you? God doesn't need you. God doesn't need you to take care of everything. God owns the cattle on a thousand hills. But a lot of times, it's a test of our submission and our obedience. So, B, to accomplish the why that God wants, we must submit ourselves to him. First, we must submit ourselves in salvation. Every single one of us has to have a time in our life where we realize we're a sinner. We realize that we cannot get ourselves to heaven and that we need Jesus Christ to save us. And we have to come to a point and we say, God, I realize that no church can get me to heaven. My good works can't get me to heaven. Baptism can't get me to heaven. Communion can't get me to heaven. But the only thing is, that I surrender and recognize that you sent your son Jesus to die on the cross for my sins. And I repent of my self-reliance to get myself to heaven. And that I confess with my mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in mine heart that God hath raised from the, from the dead. And then I am saved. And when we come to that realization and we re repent of our reliance upon ourselves to get to ourselves to heaven and we accept Jesus Christ as the only way, the truth, and the life, then we accomplish submission for salvation. But as long as we're still relying on ourselves, then we're standing in the way of salvation. The second is our walk. Would you take your Bibles and turn them to James chapter 4 with me? In James chapter 4, the Bible says in verse 6, but he giveth more grace unto the but he giveth more grace, wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. Submit yourself therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. You know, God wants us to take in our walk and recognize that it is him who gives more grace. That our key is, the, in order to get that more grace, is to humble ourselves. How do we do that? We submit ourselves to God. We resist the devil in our fleshly thinking. We draw nigh to God. He draw nigh to us. We cleanse our hands, our sinners. We purify our hearts, ye double-minded. We stop having that double standard and we say, God, my walk with you is today I lay and I serve at the pleasure of my God. Now, I've got a question. Do you, is the why of the way you operate, today, God, I serve at your pleasure? Today, God, I give to your pleasure. Today, God, I do exactly as you want me to do. Today, God, my attitude is exactly the way that it should be. Even though I want it to be someplace else, I serve for you. I have no will of mine. I have no money of mine. I have no time of mine because, God, today I serve at the pleasure of my God. So in order to tie all this together, to accomplish the why of the authority, or to accomplish the why, then we need to take the authority that God has put over us, and we must submit to whatever authority God has put there. So you know what that means? I take the box that God has put me in today, and I serve to the best that I can do it. In Colossians chapter 3, it teaches us that we're not supposed to serve our masters or our bosses as uh, unto them, but as unto God. And so I set myself aside 
and I serve at the pleasure of my God. The boxes that he gives us are many. I mentioned one of them, our bosses, our work. When you are at work, are you serving at the pleasure of your boss and serve him as you're serving God? Well, you don't understand. He don't treat me right. He don't pay me enough. He doesn't do that. Well, if you're in God's will, did God put you there? Yes. Are you supposed to serve God in the way that he'd want you to? Yes. That's being a good steward. That is humbling yourself and saying, I'm not here because I work for him. I'm here because I work for God. In your family, does everybody function in your family exactly the way they're supposed to. you got to leave it to Beaver family. Everybody's smiling. Everybody's good. No attitudes. All right. If your family's like that, I'd like to meet them. All right. We have to recognize that it's imperfect situation. But we don't function within our family and serve our family as reacting to what they do because we are a child of God. And the why is I serve my God and I'll follow scripture. I'll have my heart and my mind frame to be as Christ. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God. Today, I die to self and I serve to the authority that God's put over me. We ought to build a spiritual structure of leadership. We ought to have the mind frame that, God, I will follow the paths that you have for me. I'm going to quit fighting everywhere around and sticking up for myself, and I'm going to hoard my time, my talent, my treasure. But today, my time, my talent, and my treasure, they're surrendered to you. And if you get that why right, then all the what's fall into place. Because you give as God wants you to give. You serve as God wants you to serve. And you minister as God wants you to minister. Lord, thank you for loving us. Lord, so many times we get stuck, we get selfish, we get frustrated. When none of that's necessary. What is necessary is that we humble ourselves before you, that we serve at your pleasure. Well, Lord, I pray that you'd help us now surrender our hearts and do our stewardship, not just the what, but the why, and serve with a great heart. With our heads bowed, our eyes closed, who would say, Pastor Scott, as you spoke today, I see some areas in my life that they're not surrendered all the way to God. Maybe it's in my time, my talent and treasure, but today I'm going to do my best to serve at the pleasure of my God. Pray for me. Would you raise your hands? Amen. Praise God. Who else? I need to serve at the pleasure of my God. Who else? Amen. Who here would say, you know, you mentioned two areas of submission. One was in our walk with God, but the other was in salvation. And the fact is, is I've never had that in my life. If I died today, I don't know for sure I'd go to heaven. And I've never asked Jesus to come into my heart. And I've always relied on myself for my salvation. And I need to fix that. Pray for me. Is there anybody there here who would say, I'm not sure I'm going to heaven, but I'd sure like to know that. Pray for me. Would you raise your hand so I could pray for you? Anybody at all? Amen. Amen. Anybody else? All right. Lord, work in our hearts. Help us to surrender them to you. Help us serve you. Help us give of ourselves to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand with me? As the music plays, if God spoke to your heart, come down and bend a knee and say, God, here's what I've been holding back. Here's what I've been hoarding. Here's what I've been keeping to myself. Say, God, I give this to you. Here's what I'm trying to control. I'm going to let that go and I'm going to serve at the pleasure of my God. Who else? If you don't know for sure you're going to heaven, come on forward and somebody will take the Bible and show you how you can know for sure that you're going to heaven. 
Who else needs to come? Who else needs to come?